Welcome to My Vaccine is Jesus. Today's discussion is in the New Testament Treasures playlist and is entitled A Crown of Thorns. Before we begin a short prayer, all blessing, honor, glory, and worship to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit for now and forever and unto ages of ages. Amen. I pray to Almighty God to be filled with the Holy Spirit so my part to speak truth without error and to interpret Holy Scripture correctly. All truth comes from God. Any errors are my own. I also pray that you, the viewer and listener, may likewise be filled with the Holy Spirit so that any truth I speak or any scripture that I interpret correctly is welcome in your heart, your mind, and your soul. Now let us begin the discussion. So let's look at Matthew chapter 27, verse 29 up top, and John chapter 19, verse 2 on the bottom. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And then in John, and the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe. Now in Greek, the word for thorns is akanthon. You can see that's Greek Strong's word number 173. Akanthon, five occurrences in the New Testament. Matthew chapter 7, verse 16. Matthew chapter 27, verse 29, which we see there in the upper left and Luke chapter 6, verse 44. So Matthew chapter 7, verse 16 up top, Luke chapter 6, verse 44 on the bottom. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? That's in Matthew and in Luke. For every tree is known by his own fruit. For of thorns men do not gather figs, nor of a bramble bush gather they grapes. Now what's interesting about at least the grape references Genesis chapter 49, verse 11. This is a probably a great prophecy of the Messiah to come, the Shiloh to come, who's going to be the house of Judah. Uh, start in uh, verse 10. I'm going to look at verse 11 here. Binding his foal unto the vine and his ass's colt unto the choice vine. Obviously, that makes you think of Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, and Lord Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. He washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. So again, grapes are connected to wine. Wine is connected to the blood of Lord Jesus, right? And so the grapes have that sort of a spiritual reference. Thorns, as you see, have a spiritual reference of sin and uh, wickedness, right? So that's interesting there. What's even more interesting is if you look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 18. This is after Adam and Eve ate of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And right after eating of it, when their eyes were opened and they realized they had sinned and were ashamed, they made aprons of fig leaves. Later, when there's curses on the woman, there's curses on the serpent, and then there's curses on the man, Adam, and the earth. And let's pick it up at Genesis 3.18. Thorns also and thistles shall it, the land, the earth, bring forth to thee because of sin, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. And there's the Greek Septuagint in the middle. And then there's the Greek of Matthew 7, 16 below. And look, look, thorns, akanthas, akanthon. Thistles, by the way, tribolus, tribolon. Pretty interesting. And notice the, uh, the fruit that's mentioned in Matthew 7, 16 is figs. And again, if you eat the fruit of a tree of knowledge of good and evil, and afterwards your eyes are opened, you realize if you sinned, you're ashamed, and then you make fig leaves. Doesn't it suggest that possibly that fruit you ate was figs? Pretty cool stuff indeed. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 8. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. Notice, thorns, briars are rejected, are a curse, and their end will be burning. We got Luke chapter 8 verse 7 and we got John chapter 19 verse 2 uh, that, uh, that's on the bottom over there on the left. So let's look at Luke chapter 8. We're going to look at verses 4 through 8 here which includes verse 7. And when much people were gathered together and were come to him out of every city he spake by a parable. A sower went out to sow his seed and as he sowed some fell by the wayside and it was trodden down and the fowls of the air devoured it. And some fell upon a rock, and as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And here's verse 7. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it, and other fell on good ground and sprang up and bare fruit an hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he cried, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. I wonder what he means by that. There's verse 7. There's the akonthon, but notice 
That's the first thorns. The second thorns is akanthe, same Greek Strong's word. Akanthe, three occurrences in Scripture. Matthew chapter 13, verse 7, Mark chapter 4, verse 7, and Luke chapter 8, verse 7. If you look at Matthew and Mark, they're the same account of the, uh, the sower here. Continuing, Luke chapter 8, now we got verses 11 through 15. Now the parable is this. This is when he's describing what the parable means to his disciples. The seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are they that hear, then cometh the devil, and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. They on the rock are they which, when they hear, receive the word with joy. And these of no root, which for a while believe, and in time of temptation fall away. Verse 14, and that which fell among thorns are they which, when they have heard, go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life, and bring no fruit to perfection. Kind of carnal things, sinful things. But that on the good ground are they which, in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it, and bring forth fruit with patience. So in verse 14, the thorns is akanthas, same Greek Strong's word. Akanthas, six occurrences in Scripture, Matthew chapter 13, verse 7, Matthew chapter 13, verse 22, Mark chapter 4, verse 7, Mark chapter 4, verse 18, Luke chapter 8, verse 14. All of those, by the way, are the parable of the sower. And then we got Hebrews chapter 6, verse 8. Let's look at that. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh to cursing, whose end is to be burned. So notice the connection to thorns and being burned. And there it is, Greek, Strong's work, akantha, akantha, prickly plant thorn. It's a feminine noun, a prickly plant thorn, thorn bush, prickly plant a thorn. And by the way, there's also word 174, akanthinos, that's an adjective of thorns made of thorns. And that's akanthinon here, used two occurrences in scripture, Mark chapter 15, verse 17, and John chapter 19, verse 5. Let's look at those. Mark on top, and they clothed him with purple and plaited a crown of thorns and put it about his head. And then in John, then came Jesus forth wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate saith unto them, Behold the man. Hmm. Burning and thorns. What does that remind you of? Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb, which is Sinai. And the angel of the Lord, that's the pre-incarnate Lord Jesus Christ, right, appeared unto him in a flame of fire, flux pitos, out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here am I. So notice in verse 2, bush is mentioned twice. In verse 3, it's mentioned once. In verse 4, it's mentioned once. And also notice it's the angel Lord speaking in verse 2. But then it's the Lord in verse 4 and God calling unto him from verse 4. And he said, Draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground, which is what the captain of the Lord's host says to Joshua in Joshua chapter 5. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And later, the angel of the Lord, the Lord, God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, uh, refers to himself as yod heh vav -He, and refers to himself as Eye aser Eye, or in the Greek, eho emi o on So there's bush in the Hebrew in Exodus chapter 3, verse 2. It's actually three times, forgive me. It's, notice it's Hebrew Strong's word 5572. It's ha se ne, ha se ne, we ha se ne. That's in verse 2. In verse 3, Hasene in verse 4, Hasene. There is the Hebrew Strong's work 5572, Sena, Sena, perhaps a blackberry bush, masculine noun, perhaps a blackberry bush. Now it's interesting, blackberry bushes have thorns, don't they? Hasene, four occurrences, Exodus chapter 3, verse 2, two times there. Once in Exodus chapter 3, verse 3, and once in Exodus chapter 3, verse 4. And then let's look at it in the Septuagint. I'm not going to read the whole Greek, but batu is uh, basically the bush uh, in verse 2 there. 
You see batos, batos, also in verse 2. Batos in verse 3 and batu in verse 4. And that's Greek, Strong's word 942, batos. Noun, feminine, noun, masculine, depending if it's batos or batu or bato or boti. A bramble bush, a thorn bush, or a bramble. Bramble, bush, a briar shrub, a bramble. Oh, that's a thorn bush. Isn't that interesting? So the burning bush was a thorn bush, and it continued to burn. The fire would not go out. And we know that thorns is what Jesus is crowned with, and that represents sin, doesn't it? So the sin will keep burning and burning and burning. Batu, four occurrences in the New Testament, Mark chapter 12, verse 26, Luke chapter 6, verse 44. And again, they're talking about the burning bush, Mark, Luke chapter 6, verse 44, we looked at earlier. Then we got Luke chapter 20, verse 37, again, talking about the burning bush. And Acts chapter 7, verse 30, again, talking about the burning bush. We have Bato. One occurrence, that's in Acts chapter 7, verse 35, again, talking about the burning bush. Notice this when Stephen was talking to the Jews. we got Matthew chapter 3. Now let's get into this whole idea of why the sin is burning, why the thorn bush is burning forever, it appears, right? The fire would not go out. Matthew chapter 3, verses 11 uh, through 12. This is John the Baptist basically prophesying of the Lamb of God, Lord Jesus Christ. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. Again, bringing you back to the burning bush, bringing you back to the um, captain of the Lord's host, the pre-incarnate Jesus from Joshua chapter five. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Hmm. What does that remind you of? Matthew chapter 13, verse 24 to 30 here. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But when men slept, remember the good seed? His enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the household came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while you gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Now, isn't it interesting? At the harvest time, it appears you can distinguish between the wheat and the tares. Whereas before the harvest, if you gather up the wheat, you're going to gather up the tares too. I wonder why that is. Okay, there's mature wheat in the background and there's mature tares in the foreground with the green. So the kind of golden obviously is the wheat and the green is the tares. This is at harvest, you can easily distinguish them. But when they're younger, it's very difficult to distinguish them. Isn't that interesting? What a beautiful parable of Lord Jesus, why the wheat and tares are used. Matthew chapter 13 now verses 36 to 43 again is Lord Jesus gonna explain the parable. Then Jesus sent the multitude away, went into the house, and his disciples came out to him saying, declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. And he answered and said unto them, he that soweth the good seed is the seed of son of man, yet again, the field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one, Satan, right? The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The son of of man, or this age, by the way, the Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity. Because remember, this world actually is the kingdom of Lord Jesus, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous sign forth as the Son, and the kingdom of their Father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. So notice, at that harvest, at the end of the world, the wicked are going to be cast into a furnace of fire but the righteous will basically enter the kingdom of heaven, it appears, right? Matthew chapter 13, verse 10 to 13. 
And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. For whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whoso hath not from him shall be taken away even that he hath. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. What does that remind you of? Matthew chapter 13, verses 14 through 17 here. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, who is going to explain it, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand. And seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is wax grossed, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you, that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which you hear and have not heard them. Let's look at that in Isaiah. Chapter 6, verses 1 through 4 here. In the year that King Uzziah died, I, the prophet Isaiah, saw also the Lord, right, Adonai, but it's referring to yod heh you'll see, sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, 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 thrice holy is the Lord of hosts. Remember, holy means separate or apart, 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 apart. Separate, separate, separate. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. So there's Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3, with holy, holy, holy. Well, guess what? Revelation chapter 4, verse 8. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within. And they rest not day and night, saying, holy, holy, holy. Separate, separate, separate. Apart, apart, apart. Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Who's that? That's the Holy Trinity. That's the triune God. The one on the throne, the one being of God is a family, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, Holy Father, Holy Son, Holy Spirit. Continue in Isaiah chapter 6, verses 5 through 7. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. So notice, he's alive. In his corruptible body, he's living with other people with corruptible bodies. They all have unclean lips. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Hmm, what does that spiritually reference? Could it possibly be Holy Communion, the body and blood of Lord Jesus Christ that kind of takes away our sin even in this life and assists us? Again, we need to see and believe upon Lord Jesus to have eternal life, but guess what? We need to eat his flesh and drink his blood, right? The Lord's Supper. That also assists us spiritually in this life. Finishing off, Isaiah chapter 6, verses 8 through 10 here. Also heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Wait a minute. I'm going to send someone, but it's going to go for us? Hmm. So first person singular pronoun, first person plural pronoun. What's all that about? Then said I, here am I, send me. And he said, go and tell this people. Here, here's what's being referred to in Lord Jesus over there to the right. Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and convert, and be healed. Notice Lord Jesus says, I should heal them. That's how they're going to be healed, by Lord Jesus Christ, right? The Word of God made flesh. The pre-incarnate Son taken, who took on flesh. John chapter 12 here. So if you notice in Isaiah chapter 6, we see Lord God on the throne. We have the holy, holy, holy reference. We have the who shall I send, who shall, will go for us. Look at John chapter 12. By the way, it also spoke of the, his glory there, didn't it? Verses 37 to 41. But though he had done, obviously referring to the Lord Jesus, so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him, that the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed a report, and to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed. That's Isaiah chapter 53. Therefore they could not believe, because that Isaiah said again, here's Isaiah chapter 6, he hath blinded their ears and hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory and spake of him. Who's referring to Lord Jesus? Well, wait a minute. Isaiah chapter 6, there was one being on the throne, right? Yeah. It was the Adonai, right? Yeah. It was yod heh right? Yeah. Well, the Father had to be there, right? Of course. But this says the Son was there as well. He was. Hey, how about the Holy Spirit? 
Acts chapter 28, verses 23 to 25 here. This is uh, Paul in Rome. And when they had appointed him a day, there came many to him unto his lodging, to Paul's, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets, from morning till evening. And some believed the things which were spoken, and some believed not. And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed. After that, Paul had spoken one word, well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet unto our fathers saying, Go unto this people and say, Hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see and not perceive. For the heart of this people is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. There's the Holy Trinity. You just saw it. Isaiah chapter 6, the Father's there, right? Okay. But we know that in John chapter 12, the glory of the Son is there, right? So the Son was there. And in Acts chapter 28, we know that... The Holy Spirit spoke, so the Holy Spirit was there. But there was only one being, exactly. Oh, three persons in one being, exactly. A perfect family, exactly. Holy, 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 holy trinity. There it is. Now, let's finish off Isaiah chapter 6. There's some interesting things here that, Lord willing, I'll get into in a subsequent video in the future. Then said I, Lord, how long? And he answered, until the cities be wasted without inhabitant, and the houses without man, and the land be utterly desolate. Wow, this sounds almost like the end of the world. And the Lord have removed men far away. Hmm, what men? Good men? Far away to where? Like to heaven? Oh, is this after the rapture maybe? And there be a great forsaking in the midst of the land. Verse 13, and yet in it, the land, shall be a tenth, and it, the land, shall return and shall be eaten as a teal tree and as an oak whose substance is in them when they cast their leaves, so the holy seed shall be the substance thereof. Hmm. Well, this is an example where actually I think an other English translation explains the verse better. Here's the NIV, verse 13 again, because that was very cryptic and strange. What did that mean? And though a tenth remains in the land, it will again be laid waste. But as the terebinth and oak leave stumps when they are cut down, so the holy seed will be the stump in the land. Oh, so after certain individuals are taken far away, maybe after the rapture, in these end times here, there's still going to be some holy seed that remain. Okay, and I think this refers possibly to the two witnesses of Revelation chapter 17 and possibly of the 144,000 of Revelation uh, 7 and 14 who assist in spreading the gospel on the earth during the wrath of God when all other believers have been taken out of the land. Anyway, just something interesting to mention there. Let's continue. Luke chapter 12, verse 49. I have come to ignite a fire on the earth and how I wish it were already kindled. Again, I like this rendering better than the King James here. King James you know, says the same thing, but the, it's a little harder to understand what Lord Jesus is saying. And the Brian Study Bible here is it just another example of, I think it just uh, states it better in a way that we uh, current modern English speakers will understand better. Matthew 25, verse 41, Then shall he say also, this is final judgment, judgment of the sheep and the goats, right? It's in Revelation 20 as the great white throne judgment. Here's Matthew 25 again, verse 41, Then shall he say, this is Lord Jesus speaking of himself also, the king unto them. On the left hand, the goats, depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. So notice this everlasting fire is prepared for the devil and his angels, his demons, his devils, right? But there are certain goats who go to it as well. And it's everlasting. Remember that thorn bush just kept burning and burning? Matthew chapter 25, verse 46. And these, the goats, shall go into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Kind of a different way of what we just saw earlier in Lord Jesus' description of the meaning of the parable of the wheat and tares. Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 through 12 here. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same, that man who worships the beast and his image and receives his mark, that same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, in the presence of the Lamb. So notice, who rules Gehenna? Because it isn't Satan and his devils. They burn there. Who rules it is Lord Jesus, the Lamb, and his holy angels. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image. And whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Wow, they're going to burn eternally. They're going to have smoke of torment ascending forever and ever. They're going to have no rest from the torment. 
Here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Here's the point. When we see all this wickedness happening, don't take fret. Lord God will make it all right. And with the wickedness you're seeing in this world right now, you know what? Some people do deserve, it appears, everlasting torment. Again, all the judgment and mercy is up to God. Whatever God decides is the right thing, obviously. Revelation chapter 19, verse 20, and the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet, by, you know, by uh, Lord Jesus when he comes on his white horse with uh, King of Kings and Lord of Lords on his, uh, on his thigh, and the one having done the signs before him, by which he deceived those having received the mark of the beast and those worshiping its image. The two, right, the beast and the false prophet, were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone, the very first two people entering the final hell, Gehenna, the outer darkness, right, the lake of fire. Revelation 20, verse 10, and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. This is a thousand years later, where the beast and the false prophet are and shall, by the way, in the Greek it says they shall, the three of them, be tormented day and night forever and ever. So notice, the beast and the false prophet had been there burning for a thousand years and they're still burning when Satan's thrown in. Again, eternal burning. Hey, remember that uh, burning bush in Exodus chapter three that just kept burning? Uh, Revelation 20, verse 14, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Verse 15, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So the first person thrown in is the beast, with him the false prophet, and then the third is Satan, and then all the dead are thrown in, all those not written in the book of life. Revelation 20, verse 11, let's go a little early, and I saw a great white throne. And him that sat on it, Lord Jesus, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. Wait a minute. If the earth, the physical dimension, and the heaven, the spiritual dimension, flee from the face of Lord Jesus and there's found no place for them, it sounds like they're, they're destroyed. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 10 through 12. This is the Father speaking to the Son. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens are the work of thine hands, proving Lord Jesus is the creator and no tool. The Father is calling him Lord, Kyrios, which is how the Greeks would refer to Yote 5a anyway. And he's also stating that the sun's hands created the heavens and earth. They shall perish, but thou remainest, and they all shall wax old as doth a garment, speaking of the heavens and earth, and as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. So notice, it's Lord Jesus who created them, and it's Lord Jesus who's going to destroy them. Second Peter verse, uh, chapter 3, verses 10 through 13 here. But the day of the Lord, which will come at uh, will come as a thief in the night. We know that's Lord Jesus. In the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat and the earth also and the works that are in it shall be burned up. So notice, Lord Jesus is gonna destroy by fire the heavens and earth. Uh, verse 11, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God? Wait a minute. We have the day of the Lord that comes as the thief. That's the day of Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the same day as the day of God. What does that also prove? Yet again, Lord Jesus Christ is God, just not the same person as his Father or the Holy Spirit. When the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwell right, dwelleth righteousness. And this obviously is created at the beginning of Revelation chapter 21. This destruction happens in that, uh, in that middle, basically, of Revelation chapter 20 that we saw. And check this out. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 through 15. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me, again, Paul speaking, as a wide master builder, I have laid the foundation, and other buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than which, that, that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So again, the foundation is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, so notice, we're talking about believers here. We're talking about people who build upon the foundation, that's Lord Jesus, gold, silver, precious stones, which are works that matter to God, wood, hay, stubble, which are works that don't matter to God. Every man's work shall be made manifest for the day. What's that? The final day, the day of the judgment of the sheep and the goats, the day of the great white throne judgment. We saw that in Revelation 20. For it shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire again. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is, every man. So the sheep's work will be judged by fire for reward or no reward. And the goat's work will be judged by fire for judgment, which they fail, of course. If any man's work abide, these are those who have the foundation. The time of the sheep here in verse 14, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive reward. So in the next life, in the new heavens and new earth, you will be rewarded for the works that you've done that glorify God. 
If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So if we've done works in this life which have no value to God, we're not going to get any reward for them, but we're still going to be in the family in the new heaven and the new earth and the new Jerusalem. Matthew chapter 16, verse 27. How do we know all of that's Lord Jesus Christ on that throne, right? Is it enough that he teaches us in Matthew 25 it's him? Well, we got more. Matthew 16, verse 27. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. So we'll be rewarded for good works with reward. And they'll be rewarded for whatever works, right? Because if, 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 they're, if they're judged, it doesn't matter what good things you've done. If you don't see and believe upon Lord Jesus, if you don't accept the Holy Spirit, if you don't accept that gift of eternal life, you will be in Gehenna, which is eternal burning, just like that burning bush kept burning and burning and burning. John chapter 5, verse 22, For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. Yet again, I love this, because look at the next verse, that all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father, just as they honor the Father. The same as how they honor the Father, identical to how they honor the Father. So if you don't worship the Son, proclaim him to be your God, right? You're not honoring him the same as you honor the Father. And notice how it continues. He that honoreth not the Son honoreth not the Father which hath sent them. So if you don't do that, you honor nobody. So if you're Jehovah Witnesses, you honor nobody. If you're a Unitarian, you honor no one. And then notice this about the honor. John chapter 5, verse 41. And again, in the King James, it says, I receive not honor from men, right? And that could confuse you, maybe. That's what it says is, I do not take glory from men. See, we should give him honor. We should give him glory. He doesn't take it from us. It's our choice. Revelation chapter 22, verse 12, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Notice every man. It's Lord Jesus. Why do I like this verse? Notice the next verse. Notice what Lord Jesus does in that verse. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. So I don't know what... It takes, if you have any doubts out there, Lord Jesus Christ is God, just not the same person as his Father or their spirit. I pray this book truth and interpret the scripture correctly so that this discussion might have been a blessing to you, the viewer and listener. All truth comes from God. Any errors were my own. If it was a blessing to you, I would greatly appreciate it. If you could like, comment, share it, subscribe to the channel. Lord willing, we shall meet again. May the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless us all. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus.